you, sir. I appreciate it. We are live. Back again, back again. Who remembers what we talked about in our previous lesson? Besides chapter and verse. That's an easy one to remember. Okay. Let's dig into some specifics though. I feel like eighty percent of the Psalms you could <laughs> you could say that and you'd be you'd be correct somewhere. Absalom will come up again. Okay, all right, there you go. There's we talked we talked a little bit about Absalom. Um we uh we talked about David's what's the word I'm looking for here? David, I guess I guess faith is is the best word. David David's faith and confidence in the Lord to solve the issue. Um, verse uh, of chapter three, verse uh, six says, "I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people." Um, and I got to thinking actually, as because chapters three and four are kind of connected just a little bit. If you look at um, uh, you look at chapter, uh, you you look at verse six. It says, "I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people." Uh, David kind of lived a life of going against immeasurable odds. Um, when he arrives on the scene, and I'm not even talking about Goliath. The first thing, the first thing that he overcame was people's perception of him. Uh, his father, Jesse, waltzed literally every single son he had out in front of Samuel before he finally ran and got David. Um, David, of his, uh, you know, in his shepherd boy years, of his, of his, of his own uh, word, said that he slew a bear and a lion uh, by himself. You look at, then you look at the time that he spent fighting Goliath. Um, those horrible times in the courtroom with Saul, then being pursued by Saul. Um, and it seems like at every step in David's life, he was faced with insurmountable odds, but always came back at those odds with a measure of faith, with a measure of faith to rise to the occasion, to, uh, to allow God to work through him to fulfill his purpose. Um, and Absalom's coup of the throne um, was no different. Yeah. Was uh, was uh, very similarly uh, uh, handled. Anybody else have anything that they remember we talked about? Yep. And then the next time he said, uh, shall I go up? He said, no. Because you, you stand more worthy. And we come out just like that. I mean, he, his faith was so strong in God, see, that a lot of times he, he often missed his life. His life. He, he knew he, he'd done, he done testing. He was playing out. He'd done testing. But like you pointed out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. His, his faith was... His his faith his faith was definitely unparalleled in physical things, but a lot of times, like us too, David's faith when it came to um, the spiritual was was where was where he fell down. He was he was he was called by the by the inspired word of God himself to be a man after God's own heart, and and yet he still committed a murder, uh, perpetrated a lot of lies. In committing that murder, um, he uh, he numbered the people. He was told not to do that, and in so doing, David, like us, robbed himself of some blessings. He, uh, I personally think, and this this might be this might not be uh, the general consensus on this, but I personally think that David's inability to work on the temple. Um, stemmed directly from his murder of uh, um, what it, was it Uzziah? Uzziah uh, uh, is that correct? Yeah, 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 
Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, he, he uh, for whatever reason, the name didn't sound right to me. <laughs> um, uh, no, but I, I think it stemmed directly from that. He w- it said they said that he was a bloody man. Now th- that could mean that he'd been in a lot of wars, but Joshua was also in a lot of wars, and Joshua did some very great things. He built a lot of altars. He did he did a lot of stuff, and so I think I think David's failings. You know, as, as great a man of faith as he was, he was still prone to failure and robbed himself of his own blessings at times. Yes. Oh yeah, De- Solomon didn't finish as strong as David did, which, based on the way that David died, I'm not sure that you could say that David finished super strong. But, uh, but, but, but Solomon, toward the end of his life, had well, he'd he'd fall, he'd he'd fall he'd, he'd he'd fallen he'd fallen to public opinion and to and to and to family pressure. Um, um and I think robbed him because I would say Solomon's relationship with God was fairly close when he started out. Um, that was not to remain though. A thousand wives, kind of. Well, they. King, kings of that time were prone to, you know, multiple wives and concubines and whatnot anyway. But uh, David and Solomon, I think their besetting sin was their lust. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a problem that, 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 that people face. Uh, but it's it also, it, you know, um, that sin led to a whole lot of, a host of other sins, spe- specifically in David's life. Now Solomon, I think, I think Solomon just had so much going on that it, it, Solomon, I think, honestly, ends up a lot like we end up. Is he's got so much outside pressure going on that the things of the Lord is literally the last thing that you think about at the end of the day. That's the last thing that you get to, and and that weakens you. And you can see it in Solomon's life from the mountain peak that he was on, where he was literally granted wisdom beyond his years and beyond the kin of other men, all the way down to where he finished up a st- steady trajectory that can be inversely followed by the number of wives that he had <laughs> going up. Yes, Brother Jarrett. Uriah the Hittite. I knew Uzziah didn't sound right. <laughs> uh, Uriah the Hittite. Thank you, Brother Jarrett. I knew I I knew some syllable there wasn't wasn't striking me just right. Uh, so Psalms chapter four is where we find ourselves. Psalms chapter four is linked to Psalms chapter three because both are believed to have been written during Solomon's run from Absalom. Both are believed to at least at least the lion's share of four and all of three are believed to have been written in the same time when Absalom was chasing him. And uh, the first verse says, Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress, and have mercy on me, and hear my prayer. David implores the Lord for aid in verse 1. He, he says, Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousnesses. Now, The, the the request that he makes is predicated upon David's righteousness. How right, if you wanna if you wanna use the if you wanna use the term, and how how well he was living, how well how righteous was he? Um, I mean, based on the lengthy conversation we just had. How how righteous was he? I'll let you, I'll let you be the judge of that. I, I, honestly, I don't know that we that we that we should judge David on his righteousness because God judges by a, a whole different metric than what we judge. David was calling upon God based upon how well he was serving. He says, "Hear hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness, 
Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Not only does he call upon him in this way, but he also said, he says, in, in times when I have been in trouble, in times when I have had problems, you have enlarged me. You have, you have made me uh, stronger than my enemies. David, the, 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 the classic uh, biblical um, account of David and Goliath is a perfect example of, I mean, David was not, David was not fit to face Goliath in any metric in which you wanted to measure him, in weapons, in, in warfare ability, in height, in weight, uh, anything, in reach. Uh, he was completely out, and yet the Lord delivered the Philistine into his hand. Uh, and he calls upon him and says, I was in, uh, uh, in thou, uh, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Now, I think that we can't, we fall, you know, we, we live in the age of grace. We ever, 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 I, would, I would not venture to say that anybody under the sound of my voice would argue that point with me. But I do think that we do dwell in a merciful, under the mercy of God at times. And specifically, I think this type of call, this call for aid, is a place where we can also dwell. This, it, it is a merciful thing for God to hear. Our, he doesn't owe us anything. Right. He didn't owe you your soul. What makes you, you think that he owes you his help? Um, you are... Uh, you are not entitled, and and, and and if anything that is that has been proven true, I'd say definitely in the last four to five years. But de- this year seems to be worse than any of them. Entitlement is something that people uh, just cling to. That I deserve X. I deserve a place to live. I deserve free education. I deserve um, a free cell phone. I deserve this. I deserve that. That this idea that because you were born you're a human, that you deserve certain things. Um, and that's that's where a lot of people, especially on a physical level, operate. And David knew, both on a physical and spiritual level, he didn't deserve anything. And so when he appeals to the Lord, he appeals to God's mercy. He appeals to the the staying of punishment of God's hand. He appeals to the ability that God has as a judge to say, yes, you're wrong. Yes, I'm right. But I'm also going to be lenient. He appeals to that aspect of God. And, and oftentimes when we find ourselves in distress, as Psalms 4 refers to it as, it, it's our fault. It's our problem. It's our it's our path that we found ourselves in. It is it it is, it is, our, is our issue. So when we go and we appeal to God, please deliver me from the punishment I've brought upon myself. We're appealing to His mercy, not necessarily His grace. Grace is what saves you. I think mercy is what uh, is is what keeps you around, so to speak, um, because we, we 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 don't dwell with God. We we don't we don't pursue after him not often enough. Yeah, his mer- J- brother Jarrett says his mercies new his mercies are new each day. The air you breathe, the food that you eat, the drink that that, that passes over your lips is is all a mercy, is all is all a a, a blessing you're undeserved of. Um. O ye sons of men. How long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Now, I believe verse 2 is calling to, directly out to Absalom, but possibly also his father. So he says, Oh, you sons of men, how will you turn my glory into shame? David, I think, is referring to his God. Uh, he, he's referring to his service to his God. He's referring to the crown that God gave him, um, the world is not going to see biblical things the way you see them. Uh, And I think especially like the types of churches that we associate, so we live in almost a sheltered society unto ourselves where we just assume that everybody knows and respects the things that we uh, we hold dear. And nothing farther could be from the truth. Uh, The world doesn't 
the world doesn't hold your values at heart. If if you don't believe that, you don't have to uh, go on your Facebook feed or uh, your 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 Twitter feed or onto uh, the regular five o'clock news for very long to find that the values that we hold dear are not the same ones they do. And in fact, you're an enemy. You're an enemy to be vanquished. You're an enemy to be uh, to, to to be brought down. David says, "Oh, you, he, he calls out to um, the people, the people around him, and he can even be, you know, from verse six, chapter three, these these tens of thousands that he that he was uh, that he's referring to. He says, "Oh, you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity?" Now, I think this specifically is a call to Absalom. Absalom probably was and definitely knew that he was an attractive gentleman. Uh, I, a little bit last week, we talked about how attractive the world's ideas are and how much better they look than our ideas. God demands a very, very astringent, specific type of worship, of service, and it's not pretty. It's not, it's not pleasing. It's deprecating to the flesh. And so offering that as a path versus what the world is offering, which is appease the flesh, fulfill the desires of the flesh, the, 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 the deepest uh, hind part of your brain fulfill its desires, and you hold these two things out before a lost and dying world, and which do you think that they reach for? We, we don't we uh, we don't live in a in a in a, what's, what's, what's the uh, the correct term the, a, a masochistic society a society that enjoys inflicting pain upon itself no we 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 live in a, specifically in the United States but I think it's worldwide we live in this in in, in societies that enjoy pleasuring themselves uh fulfilling their desires and David says, how long are you going to go after that stuff? How long are you going to... And, and this is also just a call out for, for for God's people, too. How long are you going to look to the world and all the things that the world desires before you decide to turn back to God? The, 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 the understood second part of that question is there is how long are you going to how long are you going to seek after that stuff how long are you going to go further and further away and i think we can look at the uh, we brought him up a couple of times the last couple of weeks but uh we look at the story of the, of the rich man's son the one that he divided his his living between the two and he went out he went out and he what did he, do? he wasted his he wasted his substance with riotous living he went after vanity he probably bought the nicest clothes, nicest car. Uh, if it was 2020, he would have you know the the uh, the iPhone 11 plus Max X L 15. You know they got all they got all kinds of letters and numbers on the end of them now. Uh, he would have he would have he would have uh, I don't even know are are Nike shoes still good? Uh, I I wear Walmart shoes so I, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, he would have the nicest uh, the pair of kicks on. He would have the sharpest clothes. He'd go into one of them stores in the mall that you know the the pants cost as much as my entire wardrobe. Um, and and he'd have all those things. And and that is what the world is offering you. It said, hey, if you want these things, all you have to do is invest time. In me, you you can invest money, you can invest work, you can invest your relationships, all these things. And, and and honestly, it's 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 an offering that that the devil gave to Jesus at his temptation. All these things will I give you if you just bow down and worship. And worship, mind you, does not have to necessarily be. Uh, you know, worship and servitude does not have to necessarily be, you know, falling down and, you know, doing prostrate and doing all that stuff. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one or you'll love the other. You'll love the one or you hate the other. Now, that means that if you're linked up with the world, you're going just as hard as you can at it. You're not gripping tight onto the Lord. How long will you love vanity? How long are you going to invest your life into everything everything that the world has to offer you? Uh, you know, uh, this morning I asked my parents, they just got Cumberland Connect, and I asked them how nice that was. And you know, it, it's a nice, it's a nice hat. I, 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 I compared it to the first time when you got power turned on at your house. It, it, it is that much of a life changer to go from you know 
literally the 1990s to the tw- to speeds that everybody's been enjoying for for years now. It's it's that much of a light switch flip. But that's nice to have. That's not a necessary. You know what? Air conditioning is not necessary. As much as I love air conditioning, especially in the summertime, uh, uh, lights are not necessary. You know what? Food and drink are not necessarily something that you have to go after. Now we all have to provide for our families. We all have to make sure they got a shirt on their back, especially us men. It's it's our it's our duty to do that. And there are biblical provinces gave for that. But if that's all we go after, if your love is your work, just. You're seeking after vanity. If all you can think about is the next whatever it is that you want to do, the next appointment that you can make, the next uh, the, the 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 next cl- hair hair clipping you can do, the ne- that's that that's that's mine. Uh, the 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 next pot that you can stir, the next Facebook post that you can scroll, all that stuff is vanity. And you can paint it whatever color you want. It's still what it is. And seek after leasing. Does anybody know what leasing means? Legit lies, falsehoods, identities. Uh, uh, it, now, Absalom's coup was firmly built upon lies. Uh, kind of half-truths, which are also lies. Uh, <laughs> um, his offering was that Essentially, how much better would it be if I was in charge versus now, you know, with Dad in charge? That was that was kind of the presentation. I mean, look how great I look. Look how nice I look. How much better would it be if I was in charge versus Daddy? That was pretty much that was pretty much how he went about that. Now he said he said and and, and seek after leasing. And and I think we kind of covered this when we were talking about Vandy. And you can lie to yourself. You can lie to yourself. And says, well, I'm doing this because X, Y, and Z. This is this is this is this is this is me giving back to the community or this is me doing this or this is me doing that and try to justify it to ourselves. But in the dark of midnight, when you're sitting there alone by yourself and you've missed two or three weeks of church or you've missed or you've missed four or five Wednesday night classes and or you've failed to show up for whatever the church has to offer when you've prevented uh, when you've prevented your God from allowing you to do any kind of work because you're so busy doing something else try telling your lie, that lie to yourself then and the Holy Spirit's going to come by and say it's not flying with me it's not you might as well call a spade a spade to yourself because calling it a diamond or a heart or a club ain't going to work. And you can do it to your blue in the face, but you know. And you know. God knows. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Now, despite everything that, that is going on, all the the basically the way that around David everybody had fled to, they'd fled to vanity, they'd they had fled to these lies. He says, "But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself." Now, this is the this this is the turning point. And I think we talked a little bit about the the the, the meter kind of 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 the songs in the in the psalms. This is this is the chorus. This is the this is the crescendo. This is it. the Lord has set apart. The Lord knows who's his is what basically what he's saying. The Lord has and not only has set apart anybody. You know, we all of us that are saved are set af- uh, set apart, but this this is this is this is the the qualifier here. The Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. There's a difference. It's about service, and I think you can call back to verse one. It says, "Hear me when I call, O God, of my what righteousness." It's about service. Do you want to have the ear of God? Do you? I mean, and, and this is this is an honest question. 
And you don't have to answer. You don't have to raise your hand or do anything ridiculous like that. But do you want to have the ear of God? I'm not real big on these preachers and, and, and teachers and, 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 you know, YouTube channels and stuff that preach health and wealth. And, you know, th- these are five easy steps to, you know, uh, 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 ma- making money in the Lord's service, you know. Uh, now, I don't believe in all that, but if you want the ear of God, I've got one step for you. Serve him. Because here he says, I have set apart him that is godly. Uh, the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself, colon, because of this. The next idea is directly attached to the reasoning of the previous idea. The Lord will hear when I call upon him, when I call unto him. So David had David asked the Lord in verse 1. You ask because it's not required. It's a mercy. But David knows that the Lord will respond. Why? Because David knows I'm still serving. I'm not perfect, but I'm still serving. I'm still doing the things that the Lord wants me to do. I'm still serving in the ways that the Lord has for me because I am godly, because I have righteousness. I will ask the Lord, and I know he will respond. How much stress could we alleviate in our life with that level of knowledge? All of it. Very correct. You don't have to worry about governments, societal movements, money, houses, lands, cars. You don't have to worry about any of it because you know if there ever comes a time when you're in distress, as it's called in verse 1, all you have to do is reach out and clasp a hand. And you know that when you reach out to class for that hand, he's going to reach back and class back. What a firm place to, to situate yourself. What a, that is literally living inside the fold. That is live, living in his protection. If, if we're all sheep, that's being able to bleat for help, and the shepherd, with all of his ability, is there at your aid. And yet... We don't we we choose, literally choose not to dwell there. We choose to I don't know, live in fear? Live in anxiety. I I, I hear this so much these days. I'm I'm so anxious. Why? What do saved people have to be anxious about? Literally, the core of your being is insured. <laughs> for lack of a better term. Oh, there is a better term. It's at the end of chapter 3. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Your your soul is... And if you just do your service, if you live the way that God wants you to live, you literally have that same power ready at your disposal, ready at your, at your call. Now, just because you say jump doesn't mean that God's going to say how high... That's why I think that he goes through what he goes through in verse 1. He says it's a mercy. But there's a, there's a binding contract there. It's an, it's an unspoken contract between God and his people that if we serve him, he will do the same for us. It, you're, you're, you're operating together. You know, one of my youngins, I ain't going to call out which one. One of my youngins has been instructed. We, we finished up our garage, and there's a platform in the garage. And one of them wants to bounce in and off on top of it all the time. And I have instructed this child multiple times, quit bouncing off the top of that because you will fall. You're my child. I'm clumsy. I'm going to fall just walking up and down the step. You're going to fall bouncing up off top of that. It's about this high. Don't take much. And there's a concrete floor waiting for you when you fall down. And I told, and, and I, yesterday I was sitting there, beat bopping up and down it, and I said, I'm not, I'm not going to instruct you on this. You know what the instruction, I'm not even going to whip you for it. But when you fall, you'll receive no sympathy from me. 
because I've warned you and I've I have whipped you and I've begged and I've pleaded and I've done all I'm going to do. So when you fall, there will be no sympathy for me. And it's like, oh, Adam, that's so harsh. That's just so mean. No, that's exactly what God does for us. You want God to help you when you fall down? Just do what he tells you to do. I'm there at either one of my children's aid whenever they cry as long as they didn't get there because they were disobeying me. In which case, they're probably going to get rub some dirt on it. I don't... Oh, you're, 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 you got a bone sticking out? Well, I guess, I guess you'll have to push it back in there. That's an exaggeration. But you got there because you wasn't listening. And God looks at us most of the time. We're like, Lord, help us. Look at this situation we're in. And God goes... I told you already about, I warned you, and I warned you, and I berated you, and maybe I gave you a light, light little bit of chastisement, and now I'm done with you. You're there with the wolves. Enjoy. You, you, you've, you've run down to the wolves enough times. Let them eat you up. They're not your friends. And I've asked, and I've begged, and I've pleaded, and that's where you're going to live now. David's version of this contract, and bad things are going to come our ways, whether we serve God or not, I think bad things are going to come our way. Look at Job. Job was serving God to the best of his ability, I believe, and yet literally everything he had got taken away from him. Why? Because the devil tempted, well, the devil decided, hey, he's, he's got a hedge about him, and God says, well, if you really want access, the hedge is gone. Go to town. See if he doesn't still serve me at the end of this. So bad things are going to come to us regardless of whether we serve God or not. The difference is, the difference maker is when we get in these distressful situations, when we have the anxiety and the overwhelming pressures of the world facing in on us, are you able to turn and reach for a hand that can help you? And if you're off out there by yourself, the answer is no. Let's continue. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Stand in awe and sin not. It says commune with your own heart upon your bed. I think he's talking about how we, how we uh, one, among the ways that we achieve this level of communication with God. Stand in awe and what? Sin not. Now, are we going to achieve sinless perfection? No, and David didn't either. We had this conversation at the top of the class. David never achieved sinless perfection. But we can make that effort. Every day that we wake up is a new day that we can try to do better than the last one, that we can try to serve better than the last one. There will be many that say, Who shall shew us any good? Did I, did I skip a verse? Yes, I did. Uh, all, uh, verse 5. Offer the, the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Now, he says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Now, what's it going to take to achieve this? It's a sacrifice. It's giving up all those pleasures that I said, the, the, the vain things that people seek out. It's giving all of those things up in exchange for this help in exchange for the Lord's favor. And say, well, Brother Adam, that's not much of a trade. Well, I can't help you there. That's, that's, that's between you and God. That's really, where, that's really where you stand, and maybe we, you should stand back and examine. You're, give, you're, giving, you're, you're, you're becoming a servant, and here's a word that doesn't like to be spouted at all these days. You're becoming a slave to be under protection of the Master. Being a slave is not easy. Now, despite whatever movement wants to tell you about how things were in the South, slavery in the South was not fun. Uh, I've worked outside in Southern Heat. It's not fun. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't fun for the slaves that came here. It wasn't, it, wa it, wasn't, it wasn't fun for them at all. But mostly, now there are there are photographs, there are pictures of awful awful things done to slaves. But mostly, those were what rebellious slaves, slaves that didn't want to submit to their master. But the slaves that submitted to their master, you look at photographs of them, and specifically, especially like the nannies and stuff that helped out with the children's house, they became part of the family. They stood up for photographs with their 
white masters. Why? Because they were so in tune and so in align with the rest of the family, they became family. They became part of it. Was it an easy road? No, they probably worked themselves literally until they died. And we have to exist there too. Being a slave to God's service is not fun. We will work ourselves to our die. But what what on the other end of that is it? We're part of God's family. We get we reap all those benefits. How did Jesus survive in his flesh? Now, he was God in flesh, but how did he survive in his flesh the journey to the cross? Jesus lived this life. He was so close to God, God helped him. You don't think that God helped him? I think he did, because all the way up until the skies darkened and Jehovah God turned his face away from Christ, Christ hadn't really said or done much about anything that had been done to him. But what happens the minute that God turns away from him and can't help him in this situation any longer? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus lived this life. Jesus lived the life of someone who is in perfect entombment and perfect service to God. That's where we got to live. You want to be called a Christian? What does Christian mean? I've said it a thousand times here. It means Christ-like. Jesus was a servant. Jesus washed the feet of his brethren. Jesus went and healed people that didn't deserve healing. Jesus helped people that didn't deserve his help. Let's continue. Um, there, be many, there be many to say, who will shew us any good? Lord, lift up thou, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. So David's saying, there... there to this whole argument, was there, is there anybody who can show us any good? And and what is David calling for? Just he, basically the same thing that Elijah called for with his service. Just show them who you are. Let the light of your countenance shine on them, and they'll see good. They'll they'll, they'll see good in all of its glory. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their uh, that their corn and their wine increaseth. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for thou. Lord, makest me to dwell in safety. Now, verses 7 and 8 are the physical. Now, we've talked about spiritual benefits for a while now, but these are the physical benefits of this type of service. He says, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. What he's saying? Better than harvest time. Better than when... Think about your, your the highest paycheck you ever got uh, you know, we we don't really celebrate Christmas anymore. But th- but think about the joy of a Christmas morning and all those pe- presents piled up under the tree. The best times that you've had in those t- in the, in those times now increase that. That's the fullness of your heart that you can experience with what service to God. And what else? What what is what is the what is the ultimate benefit of this? And I think we uh, people don't sleep very much anymore. People have problems sleeping, and sometimes I wonder if it's not anxiety of our own making. Look at here, it says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. A peaceful rest. A peaceful slumber. I've never rested any better than when I've worked hard. You never sleep any better than when you've worked hard. You've literally drained every bit of energy out of your body, and there's nothing else for your body to do but shut down. And this is, God says, if you work for me, not only are you going to find that sleep, that sleep that's just like, coma you're out but also peace david had the peace to fall asleep with all the enemies around him we're still talking about absalom we're still talking about all these people chasing after him and and head hunting him and yet he had the the peace and safety to lay down we're we're a very unpeaceful people we 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 crush ourselves daily with anxiety when literally the answer is sitting right in front of us and it always is. It'll always be available to us. Think about Jonah. And this is the last example I'll give. Think about Jonah. Jonah is the prime example of what happens when you don't serve God the way that you that you should. How well do you think he slept in the fish's belly? <laughs> How peaceful do you think that was? What kind of increase do you think that he received while he was in the fish's belly? Probably not much. He came out of that fish's belly, and he probably smelled awful. He probably was hungry, and he probably was tired. But you know what? He walked a day. He, 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 he shortened up, what was it, a three-day journey down to one day to get to Nineveh. 
to serve God. Jonah's a prime example of where we dwell most of the time and will cry out from the fish's belly, and it's, it is it is wonderful that the Lord he hears us there because we got ourselves in that position. Why? Because simple service to God. How much better would it have been to... It didn't even, God didn't even say he had to run. He just said, go to Nineveh. He could have walked to Nineveh. <laughs> He could, have, he could have made that a week-long vacation walking up to Nineveh, but he would still been in the perfect will of God. No, instead, Jonah thought it would be better if he flees to Tarshish. He, I don't know what Jonah's intentions was when he got there, but I bet it was vanity. I bet it was, you know, I'm going to start a new life. I'm going to start a new life away from the power of God. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to set up a business. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have some kids. Maybe I'm going to have me some land and maybe some vineyards. Maybe we're going to throw some parties. It's going to be so wonderful outside the sight of God. And he found out very quickly, you can't run that far. Pun that will catch up to you <laughs> every time. Are there any questions or comments about Psalms chapter 4? Brother Jarrett? Yeah. We're like a we're like a whirly gig in the wind. Just a spinning and a spinning and not going anywhere. <laughs> Anything else? All right. That is the lesson for today. We'll come back and we'll start looking at Psalms chapter 5 in the next lesson. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching, those that are watching. And y'all have a great week. Thank you.